Hi, I'm Mark Dorsby, and this is our video series on phenomenology, Who's Real Ideas One. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the second part of Ideas One and the second chapter. Um, so let me go ahead and move there now. Um, welcome back. So again, um, this video is we're just following through with Husserl's discussion um, as he builds towards a, a rigorous account of um, what phenomenology is and ultimately a rigorous account of consciousness. So chapter two, consciousness and natural actuality. Uh, we're going to see Husserl is going to continue his discussion of the natural attitude in this chapter. So section 33 here is uh, titled, A Preliminary Indication of Pure or Transcendental Consciousness as the Phenomenological Residuum. So, uh, first off, keep, go back and just recall his conception here of the phenomenological epoch. Um, and there, uh, remember, the phenomenological epoch had to do with the idea that we can bracket off the, we can bracket off parts of our experience, as it were, uh, by suspending that which we call the general positing of actuality, right? So, um, so just to give you an example, I'm looking at the coffee cup, and while I'm looking at the coffee cup, um, I have all of these experiences, but even though I'm given these experiences in the natural attitude, I posit this general actuality, I can, as it were, suspend um, whether or not how I treat my perception in terms of whether or not it's a perception of some, a natural object or whether or not it is merely, uh, it's merely just an appearance, right? I suspend the actuality, my positing of actuality for the cup, right? And of course, for him, this reveals that there is, a, that we can do this with all of our perceptions in consciousness and all of the experiences we have in consciousness, we can, as it were, suspend this um, suspend the general positing that we find in the natural attitude. So this is what he was talking about here. This is the phenomenological epoch. But there's an important question here, which is, to what extent does this involve a restriction of its universality? That is, how far does this suspending process extend? Uh, because what he's going to sort of realize is that, well, it's really not a full exclusion of everything, right? It's not a complete exclusion of the world. For instance, it leaves the idos, it leaves the concepts of mathematics still available in their full reality, right? Insofar as a math, something mathematical is real, right? Insofar as it has an actuality, that actuality doesn't get suspended by the natural, I'm sorry, by the phenomenological epoch. So what this means is that it's not fully universal, right? And so that is going to ultimately allow Husserl to distinguish and articulate the idea that um, that we can that there's different ways in which we can make this suspension. Um, so let's sort of move here. So one of the things we need to delimit, right? One of the things we need to separate out and think about here is, on the one hand, we're talking about pure mental processes. Um, that's the process as such. There's pure consciousness, what consciousness is as such, and then there's this notion of the pure ego. That is, whatever it is we are, right, whatever the word I signifies, right, the pure ego is, as it were, that which is, uh, comes before experience, I would say, um, and it's sort of the seat for by which we have experiences, right? So, but all of these things start with mental processes, the ego and the consciousness available to us in the mental attitude. And what Husserl argues here is, quote, we shall therefore keep our regard fixed upon the sphere of consciousness and study what we find in imminently within it. So this is sort of important that there's different sorts of things that we can actually begin to think about in terms of what's happening with the suspension of the natural attitude. Uh, we can talk about the mental processes, we can talk about the, the consciousness, and we can talk about the structure of the ego, as it were, the structure of the self. And he says, we're not going to talk about all of that. We're going to just start with pure consciousness and, so, and some mental processes. And ultimately, here the key term here is the notion of the imminent we're going to see. Um, the imminent refers to the here and the now, as it were. At least that's how, how I conceive of it. Um, so let's sort of move here. The next sort of thing he says is that whatever sort of account we try to give of this phenomenological epoch, it's non-exhaustive, right? That is, 
we're not going to be able, he's not going to try to say everything you can say about this. In fact, Husserl thinks that phenomenology is a huge field of research that has yet been embarked upon, as you can tell as you've been reading it. Um, but it is a systematic analysis um, in which there were in which there is a method and in which our goal is to is to systematically evaluate the structures that must uh, be the case for the consciousness of our experience to be as it is, including this natural attitude and the general positing and its potential suspension. So consciousness has in itself a being of its own, Husserl argues, which in its own absolute essence is not touched by the phenomenological exclusion, right? So when we make this phenomenological exclusion, some sort of mathematical things, they don't get excluded, right? So, um, so there is something that's absolute that can't get uh, excluded, right? So this is a sort of important realization, is that because the, um, exclude, the, uh, the excluding, right, the parenthesizing, the bracketing, because that can't be extended over everything, that reveals that there's something that's pure or something that I would say comes before, something that's more logically, something that's logically prior and more fundamental, um, that's doing the excluding, as it were, right? Um, so something doesn't get touched, right? It therefore remains, and he calls it the phenomenological residuum, right? This is the sort of leftover, as it were. Now, in the natural attitude, the phenomenological residuum is unknown, right? Um, in my daily life and experience, uh, that the sort of recognition that there's a phenomenological residuum, there's a leftover part of my experience which can't be excluded, right? This is completely unavailable to me, right? So pure consciousness here is what he means by transcendent, or I'm sorry, transcendental consciousness is ultimately what we mean by pure, right? Uh, transcendental meaning not uh, meaning the um, a necessary a priori structure, right? Uh, and so this is the transcendental epoche, right? So and here you want to see is that there's there's uh, he's sort of using these terms to bracket off different fields of research. Epistemologically, this is called a phenomenological and transcendental reduction. Uh, so essentially what we've done is by uh, bracketing off, we found what was left, and therefore we've reduced our analysis, and this is a phenomenological reduction. You're going to see actually in the ne next chapter, Husserl is going to systematically talk about a phenomenological reduction. Um, so section 34 here, the essence of consciousness is theme. So Husserl sort of makes some observations, right? Number one, in the natural attitude, we attend to objects in consciousness, right? Um, right. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm drinking my coffee cup. Well, I'm not drinking my coffee cup, right? I'm drinking my coffee. Um, and so, but we don't, we, we just attend to the objects, right? Um, and there's a universal principle, he argues, that we, we've been adhering to, which is that every individual event has its own essence, as it were, right? And this essence, he thinks, can be seized upon in its eidetic um, conceptual purity, right? The, its terms of its essence, right? So he says, we seize upon and fix the pure essences that interest us. And in the process, the single facts, the facticity of the natural world taken universally, universally disappear from our theoretical regard, as they do wherever we carry out a pure eidetic research. Right. So, um, so the idea here is that this is what's going on, is that we can fix upon and seize and analyze these essential things, these essences, and we can do this through this process of phenomenological reduction. And every mental process in the stream of conscious can be seized upon in terms of this essence, right? This essence. So, 35 here is the cogito exact non-actuality modification, right? Uh, Husserl's titles here, I have to be honest, are just, are just very... Um, straight laced, I guess, right? But he sort of begins here, like, I mean, he says, let's imagine that there's a sheet of paper on the table, right? And it's, imagine it's a dark room, right? And imagine what that experience is like, right? I, I can look, walk around the room and I can see the paper from different angles. I can, I can also see that the paper appears to me differently in different ways. And even though I see it as a white paper, it's actually a whole gradation of colors when I actually see it, right? do this now, right? We, we will frequently say this is a piece of white paper, um, but if you actually look at it in its true light and actually describe it, 
you, what you'll see is that it's a whole bunch of different colors. This is the difference between a painter, an artist's eye, and uh, the average person's eye, right? The average person's eye, if they want to draw something, they draw what they think they see, whereas a painter and artist, or at least a realistic sort of painter artist, they don't draw what they think they see, they draw what they do see. And then they have to use all these different colors, and things are different shapes than one expects. Uh, and this is why it's very difficult for people to, to begin to do painting and drawing and this sort of thing. And it has to do with our an attention to our phenomenological experience. So this is what Husserl is doing. So we're going to imagine we're looking at this piece of paper. Now, we have to recognize that the paper right, um, represents for us both a cogitatum and a cogitatio. Right? What's the difference here? Well, the cogitatum is that something is being perceived. Right? I'm seeing the paper. Uh, the cogitatio is the mental process of perception that allows me to see something that's perceived. So, if you will, though I won't use that, I won't write this in the notes, right? You could say that the cogitatum refers to the thing, right? And the cogitatio refers to um, the, the way in which um, the thing is presented, as it were. Right. So, and one of the things we also recognize is that when I'm looking at the paper, and of course in the in the sort of natural attitude, right, I perceive it as something that's here and now. It's something that I can seize upon. Uh, but some things appear which are not seized upon. Right. So, notice for instance that when I see the paper, like from a different angle, if it's dark, right, um, then there's it's like imagine if the paper is bent and folded or something like this, and it's sitting on the on the desk like this. I can't see the whole thing. I can't see the paper, but I do perceive that there is something there, even though I, it's no, not determinate to me. I can't really tell what it is, All right? So that means that, um, that, and he's interested here to think about what does it mean for us to seize upon in consciousness specific objects and to perceive them, right? Um, so for instance, he argues, Every perception of a physical thing has, in this manner, a halo of background intuitions. And that is also a mental process of consciousness, or more briefly conscious, and more particularly of all that which, in fact, lies in the objective background seen along with it, right? So when I look at any object and have any experience, I not only have the perception of it, but I also have, as it were, an intuition of other things that I maybe am not perceiving directly, but I'm indeterminately sort of, they're there, as it were. This is what he calls, there's a halo of background intuitions. And this reveals that there's a halo of consciousness, as it were, right? Um, and by the way, you can also, it's interesting here to compare this with the, the earlier discussion on the phenomenological residuum here. Now, the second sort of thing is, there's a difference here. We have to take care to distinguish the objects that are intended from the modes of consciousness. But this is really the same distinction between the cogitatum and the cogitatio, right? Uh, it's one thing for me to perceive the objects, and I intend it, right? I perceive I have a directionality of consciousness towards the coffee cup when I'm thirsty, right? But this is different from the modes of consciousness that are available to us, right? Because, and this is the basic difference between there's objects in consciousness, but there's also actionalities of consciousness, right? Um, so while I'm sitting here recording this video, I'm looking at the computer screen. Um, and on the one hand, the computer screen is given in my consciousness, I, I sort of perceive it. But on the other hand, this background, this halo of consciousness, this, these background things that I only vaguely perceive, but I do perceive them as something potential on the horizon of my perception, right? That what I do is I can always, as it were, move and then and think of those. So right now I'm sitting here and there's a great philosophy conference, Philosophy of the City, and I have the flyer right behind this on a cork board, behind this screen, this monitor, right? And so right now while I'm looking at this, I don't see that, it's sort of on the halo, but then I can, as we're, move my attention to the poster in a way from the computer screen, right? So we have a, the ability to, to move our intention, to move our consciousness around, right? between objects. And so this this means that not only is there objects in consciousness, but there's certain sorts of activities in consciousness, certain modes. And this is what he means by actionalities, right? So for instance, it is important though, he sort of recognized that this is interesting, what it means for, some, for an ego, for a person to be awake, to be aware, 
It means that there's a sort of continuous effect in consciousness. Consciousness is continuously being, uh, is continuously in a state of actionality. Um, and so this is sort of important because think about what does it mean to go to sleep, for instance, um, and when you're unconscious, that indicates that you're, what's happening, on the one hand, you could say you're just turned off, but that's not a very good explanation. What you could say is that your consciousness becomes um, fixed to the point that no effects, no actionalities are actually possible, right? And this is sort of what you might say is what it means to be um, um, unawake, I suppose, right? Um, so, so take that discussion and now think about the intent of mental processes here, right, with these modes. Um, and there's a mental process that's taken universally. Now, a universal feature of all consciousness here is what he calls consciousness of. Right? And you can see he's building up towards his concept of intentionality, but he's trying to do it very slowly here, right? So we have these different, what, but this, this um, feature of consciousness is universal, right? It's all forms of consciousness, even for instance, maybe I would argue even in states of dreaming, right? When you're in a dream, you still see your dream in from fixed, though perhaps um, random movements of intention. Uh, right, you don't perceive everything or nothing. You, it's even in the state of dreaming, consciousness still, or what you might call minimal consciousness, still is a consciousness of. Right, so all of these mental processes have this in their in common, and they're called intentive mental processes. Um, okay, now intentionality though is not a relation between psychological occurrences. Right, he says we are speaking of mental processes purely with respect to their essence or of pure essences, and of that which is a priori, that which comes before, in, in a sense in which it's included in the essence, with an unconditional necessity, right? So intentionality has an absolute unconditional necessity. Um, it is not simply a relation between processes, because the other possibility, someone might argue, is that intentionality is just the relation between this sensation and this sensation and this sensation, and that's all intentionality is. It's not, it doesn't have any ontological or metaphysical um, substance to it, I suppose, or it doesn't have any ontological validity, right? It's merely just a relation between other things that do have validity. Um, and he wants to argue, no, because it's fundamentally and unconditionally uh, necessary, and it's a priori here. Um, so not every really inherent moment in the concrete unity of an intentive mental process itself has the fundamental fundamental characteristic intentionality, thus the process of being conscious of something, right? And remember here we talked about these halo of intentions, right? So while I'm looking at the coffee cup, my intentionality is directed towards the coffee cup, but these other sorts of things that I'm not directing my intention, my intention towards are still in the background of perceptions. Um, and so what that must mean then is that not every form of consciousness has is um, is an act of intentionality, as it were, right? But everything is a consciousness of, right? So for example, I see the sheet of paper and I see the dad of white, right? Uh, I love his language. It's like <laughs> um, his, the dad of white. So I see this when I look at the piece of paper. I see the white, right? Um, and and, but I, when I fix on the whiteness, um, I am directing my intentionality to something that was previously um, a part of my experience, but only in the background, right? Okay, uh, and the the idea of white, the essence, the concept of white there, right? So section thirty-seven here is he moves then now to to look at the pure ego's directedness too, right? So now let's think about what does it mean to have this directionality amidst these background. Uh, background halos of consciousness, as he calls it. Now, he says, an effective intentionality is that the subject is directed towards something, right? And the, we should be important that this directionality is logically distinct from the perception. So, the directionality is not an act of perception itself, right? It's something that's not only a priori, but it's something that's fundamentally, um, it's fundamentally necessary for perception, and therefore it can't be perception. Now, this reveals that the ego can regard certain things. We might call this just the ego regard, right? So, the intentional object of a consciousness is not the same as the object that's seized upon, right? 
Um, and so now the bright, so the intentional object when I direct myself towards towards the coffee cover, towards the sheet of paper, right? Um, this is my the directionality and consciousness. I direct it towards an object, but the the object in consciousness is not the same as the object that's actually seized. And here we're making the sort of difference here um, between the the correlates of consciousness. Now let's see if I can zoom in here. Right, um, an object is seized upon has what he calls an is an objectifying turn. So when I seize upon it in consciousness, and again just think about looking at something right now and seizing your intention on it, right? We, and there's different ways we do seize upon things in the ego, right? We also in the act of valuing, it seems like we have a different type of seizing, right? That is an act of valuing, we're turned towards the valuable. In the act of gladness to the gladsome, in the act of loving to the loved, right? Um, so there's a sort of way in which when we turn our intention and direct it, there's a sense in which it, we objectify it in a certain fashion. And th one of the things I'm personally interested in is thinking about this question of value. What does it mean um, to direct some, to direct how do values interact with the directionality of consciousness? Which is a very interesting question if one is doing a moral phenomenology. Now, let me go back to the text here, right? So in the acts of the sort uh, to which valuing belongs, we thus have an intentional object in a dual sense, right? So, when, so right, or think about, for instance, when you're watching a movie, or no, let's say you're watching a comedy, or you see someone tell a joke, right? And you seize upon their joke, right? And it's funny. Right, you you direct yourself towards it in a certain way, though. Right, you direct yourself towards it uh, the way one would direct themselves towards humor. Right, and for instance, take any joke and imagine it in very in in, a, in another situation, and it wouldn't be funny. Right, um, so you can pretty much take any joke, and you realize that um, it's not just that certain jokes and certain sorts of things make sense in certain contexts, but that we in consciousness in our experience direct ourselves towards things. Uh, and then we objectify them. So there's these two, the, the directionality therefore has this dual sense. On the one hand, there's the directionality towards the thing, and then there's the what he calls the heating of, the way in which we um, heed this directionality. So for instance, he says, and many of you I'm sure have been thinking about, well, what about my experiences of emotions? Well, he gives us a quick nod. He's going to come back to it much later, but emotional acts are found on higher levels of synthesis, right? Uh, so you can see here that he's saying that in the directionality, there's a synthesis going on. A synthesis between the directionality towards the thing, to the way in which the thing is given to me, and the way in which I heed the thing, right? And this means that there can potentially be a multiple layered system um, of directionality, and that's maybe how we can begin to understand what emotions are. Right? Emotions, we are have consciousness in emotions. Emotions aren't reason, but they are comportments in consciousness. They have their higher levels of synthesis, right? So he says, thanks to uh, this this objectivation in the natural attitude, right? And in the natural attitude, we're doing this all the time, right? And we don't even really recognize it. Uh, but thanks to this objectivation in the natural attitude, we confront and therefore as members of the natural world, not only mere things of nature, but also values and practical objects of every sort. So this is sort of important, right? Notice that for instance, when people make a moral claim about something, they make a value statement. Uh, I guess not all value statements are moral claims, but if someone makes a value statement about something, right? Um, or let me say this. Let's for instance, you're going to buy a car, right? Um, and you're you're looking at an expensive car, right? And you're looking at it in terms of its value, right? When you perceive the car, right? In your perception, you're experiencing a lot of things. You're experiencing the actual car when you're walking around it at the parking lot, but you're also experiencing other emotions, and you're also experiencing uh, different ways in which we comport to things. And you recognize the car as valuable, right, or something like this. Or, for instance, if you see your lover, you recognize your lover as someone to be loved, right? Um, and there's a sort of way in which that comes to us and in a, not an objective fashion, but we objectivate uh, what's happening um, through sort of these multiple layers of direct, uh, syntheses of directionality and, and forms of heating, as it were. So the heating of things in consciousness. Now this is interesting because if we're going to talk about what it means to heed, 
things in consciousness. And we realize that when we describe consciousness, there is a process in which we heed things. Then we can ask the question, well, what happens when we do reflection? After all, this is philosophy. And in philosophy, we're constantly reflecting. What does reflection mean exactly here? Uh, and what about these reflections on these acts, right? So consider the perception of something imminent and of something transcendent. So in ordinary cognition, the cogito does not direct itself towards the cogitation as an intentional object, but at any time it can be, right? So when I'm in, um, when I'm in consciousness, right, I, and I'm thinking thoughts, let's say, for instance, I'm thinking about where I want to take my next vacation, um, and I'm thinking about that, I don't think about it as an object, right, because I'm, I'm thinking of, of it, right? Uh, but I, at any point, I can make this sort of bifurcation and then recognize that I'm thinking about a concept, right? I'm think and I'm actually thinking about thinking, as it were. And this is sort of ref a f reflective move of consciousness. This generally describes what it means when we're conscious of things in memory and, and as well as in empathy. That should be empathy, right? Um, think about experiences when you when you have a, a memoric experience, like for, for instance, remember the last time you went on a vacation, right? What you're having a reflection. Now you're thinking about your former thoughts, right? Um, so reflection here isn't just, we're not just talking about thinking about thinking, but there's reflectiveness in consciousness where, where consciousness can make this reflective modality. Remember we're talking about modes of consciousness. Um, and so also, for instance, in forms of empathy, when you feel bad for someone or you think about what it's like for, for to exist from someone else's perspective. So this is another distinction in intentionality. Well, let's go back here. I missed it. And this is the consciousness of the imminent versus the comp consciousness, uh, which is directed towards something transcendent. So, right, because consciousness of the imminent is consciousness of what's immediately here and before me, um, whereas consciousness in the reflective move is I'm now directing myself towards the essence of my ideas, right? I'm directing myself towards the transcendental. Um, so this is sort of, there's, there's a distinction in intentionality. So, so now let's think about consciousness and natural, uh, natural actuality, right? What does it mean when we think about things being actual in this imminent sense, right? And think about the naive human being's conception. But naive human being here is just any person in a natural attitude. Right? And the first thing you recognize is that natural attitude is dual. Right? On the one hand, it belongs to the subject. And on the other hand, it is the consciousness of that world. Right? Um, so for instance, in the natural attitude, when I have to consider things being just actual, imminent, actual, real objects, on the one hand, my consciousness is my consciousness. But on the other hand, my consciousness is the consciousness of the world and is therefore the consciousness, I almost want to say it's the consciousness for the world. Right, um, so there's this sort of dual fashion here um, in consciousness. Now, how is the material world and the consciousness of the subject connected? Right, because clearly they are connected. And he says straight straight away, consciousness and physicalness are a combined whole. Right, so we're not saying that consciousness exists in some other material plane. The physical reality in, in eidetic consciousness. Right, these are all together for us in our form of experience, right? That's exactly why it's so difficult for us to disentangle our perceptions from our judgments in sort of regular experience. Now, for instance, he asked a really important question though, which is how does and how can consciousness itself become separated out as a concrete being in itself? Remember, if our goal is to is to figure out what the existing essential structures of consciousness are, we've got to be able to disentangle the part of consciousness that's in the subject and the part that's related to the world. And how can we think of consciousness as its own concrete being? How does that which is intended to it, to in it, the perceived being, become separate separated out as over against consciousness and as in its in itself and by itself? Uh, so the question is, how can we seize upon the essential consciousness um, that, occur, uh, that occurs in its own actuality? Now, <coughs> my apologies, excuse me. So section 40 here, we can now therefore begin to think about, or one of the ways in which that's sort of interesting here and important, is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. We're talking about the physical thing that's given in the person, 
uh, right, of a mere appearance of the true physical thing that's determined in physics, right? Uh, because physics talks about what the world is in sense of the world, um, right? Because if we go back to consciousness, consciousness relating to the subject, consciousness relating to the world. Physics is the most rigorous attempt to articulate the world in, it, in its concrete actuality. Um, and so, but we'll see here that, and then now, of course, the question is, what does it mean to have consciousness in itself? What's its form of being? Um, and who's, and so that's the science that he's trying to develop. And so he goes back to a very important distinction that actually goes all the way, it's a debate and a problem in philosophy, it goes all the way back to Galileo, in fact, uh, but it most prominently discussed and articulated by John Locke in his essay concerning human understanding. Um, and so he talks about primary and secondary qualities. And here I think about Locke versus Hume. And whoa, let me go back here. Um, and I talk about this in, let's go back here. I actually have a video on John Locke and Berkeley which talks about this. So you can take a look at that to see a little bit more information here. But real, just to quickly recall, John Locke's idea was that in perception, I perceived qualities, I perceived things that are actual, and those actual things have certain sorts of qualities or characteristics to them. A primary characteristic is a characteristic that's essential for the being's existence as such, like the solidity of the cup. Imagine if the cup was suddenly, imagine if I could put my hand through the cup like I could, um, as if the cup was liquid or something. At that point, you would no longer think it's a cup, right? So that reveals that solidity is a characteristic and it's a quality of the object that's totally essential and has to be in the world, as it were, right? Um, whereas secondary qualities, for instance, the color, this is a Starbucks cup, so there's green on it, right? This color green is something that's actually comes in, is manufactured in my mind, as it were, right? Um, and not manufactured, but you, of course, it's impossible for me to ever know whether or not um, we are experiencing the same color, right? We are. We both call it green, but what are we actually experiencing? And here it's important to recognize that, that you can see here that the cup is not actually essential for the thing, right? That is, if, if um, I alter the color of the cup, that doesn't actually destroy the object of the cup, right? Uh, it's not an essential quality of the cup, and it's not an essential quality because I can never know how it's given to anyone else in any other case, and guess what? It doesn't matter. We still all recognize it as an existing cup. But for instance, if we had a disagreement about solidity, then the cup couldn't exist. So we have the secondary qualities. These are essentially subjective qualities. They're qu and this is this, you can see, this is the same dichotomy between the the duality in consciousness between the consciousness from the subject uh, perspective or in, in terms of the subject and the consciousness in terms of the objects intended so he's sort of recalling this and he recalls this this this, this argument that John Berkeley John George uh, not John Berkeley I'm sorry uh, George Berkeley he argues that that ultimately this distinction is is a false distinction and and here Husserl doesn't agree with Berkeley. He agrees with Locke here because he's, and, it, and you can see why in terms of how he's um, doing his phenomenology and recognizing these sorts of dual forms of movement that are possible. Right. So he says here the space of physics cannot be the space belonging to the world given in the person in perception. Right. So what physics studies, the molecules and all the atoms and the compositions and the atomic weights of things and all of this other sort of stuff, right? That's not given to me in perception. That's not given in the person. I don't experience any of that, right? Uh, I experience the world of objects, right? That you're given to me in a specific familiar way, right? So the space of physics doesn't belong to the world that's given into the person, right? So physics is about, if you will, these primary qualities, and, and here I don't we're not I don't want to stick too closely with the primary and secondary quality distinction, but it's a, it's an entry point here, and it's useful from Husserl's perspective. It's something we can pull off the shelf of philosophy to help understand what the phenomenologist do, is doing as we set down the sorts of core elements of the philosophy. So the true being would be something that's determined completely of essential necessity, different from the actuality given in the person in perception, right? So the true being of something is given completely differently and essentially um, differently from the actuality, I think, of 
when I experience something. Um, so the true being is not the same thing as the actuality um, that I have in the general positing with things in nature. So, so he says, let us assume that wherever is given in person, in any perception, is a mere appearance of essential necessity, merely subjective. So the sensuous contents of the perceptually given itself are always held to be other than the true physical thing existing in itself. Nevertheless, the substrate is always held to be that which is determined by the exact method as having the predicates assigned to it in physics. So I really sort of like this section because you see here that Husserl is recognizing that this difference is important and this difference also delineates the sciences to a certain degree here, right? So moving to 41, and you can see here how he's building on all of these concepts ever so slowly. 41, the, what's the, he wants to talk about, he does talk about the really inherent composition of perception and its transcendental object, okay? So we've looked at the question a little in, in a little bit more systematic depth about our experience of the world, right, in terms of actuality and true being. And then on the other hand, now let's turn and ask, well, what is it, what about, what's the composition? How is perception composed as a transcendental object, right? So he asks, what is in, uh, included in the concrete, really inherent composition of perception itself as the cogitatio, right? It's not the physical thing, but it's something that's transcendent, right? So how does the transcendent therefore stand with respect to the consciousness, which is a consciousness of it, right? That's confusing. And, and I know, by the way, as you watch this video, you might want to pause it and think through these things um, because this is a sort of, this is tough stuff. Um, but here the question is, so how does this transcendental thing, how is it, what, how is it related to consciousness, um, and how is it related to the consciousness of it that we have when we do reflection, right? Um, because we see this sort of dual modality in consciousness. So take the example of walking around a chair, right? The chair is something that's one thing, it's a unitary entity that's actually given through a concatenation of adumbrations. That is, I experience the, all of the, I experience the chair in multiple ways, right? And there, it's adumbrated such that every time I experience it from one perspective, something is coordinatedly given and then um, not given in my perception. So I don't see the back of the chair and then I walk around, but now I don't see the front of the chair. So that's an adumbration, but the concatenation and the com combination of them gives me this experience of the chair being just one thing, right? Um, it's enough of essential necessity that there belongs to anything that has, that's unitary, that has all sides, continuously unitary, self-confirming experiential consciousness of the physical thing a multifarious system of continuous multiplicities of appearances and adumbrations in which all objective moments falling within perception with the characteristic of being themselves given in person are adumbrated by determined continuities. That is a huge, uh, almost, I think, a very dangerous sort of quote in a video like this. It's um, The writing style is difficult here. Um, but the idea here is that this whole concatenation in our experience is given by a sort of determined continuity, right? At least in the beginning, it's determined because it can only be concatenated in one way. That's what it means for it to be a unity. Um, and it's, and it, but it's continuous, so it's a continuity. So the, but the unity of the object corresponds to a determinate descriptional composition, essentially. That is, I can describe the object uh, in terms of the composition of how all of these things fit together. Right, uh, I've experienced it in different ways, but no matter how I stand, it's still given to me constantly as a unitary thing that's continuously determined by some common principle. And so this composition, of course, um, can, I describe it compositionally. And of course, you're going to see here that this is what we call a synthesis of identification. We identify something by synthesizing all of these component parts. And you're going to see here, this of course gives us a way into the question of how we can, what it means for us to reflect upon reflection, as it were, right? to reflect upon consciousness. What we're doing is, the, what the phenomenologist must do is make these descriptions, these eidetic descriptions, and understand how they're continuously determined in a synthesis of identification. Now, we, we weren't looking at, because, of the, because the phenomenologist will suspend the general positing of actuality, 
that must that means that the syntheses therefore we can do I say through by suspending the actuality we therefore can move into understanding the concatenation of the transcendental structures of consciousness now section 42 here is being as consciousness and being as reality there's an essentially necessary difference between the modes of intuition right so the first sort of thing here is that the physical thing is transcendent to perception, right? The actual physical thing. So using the language of Kant, right, we have phenomena and the noumenal. The noumena is the thing in itself not perceived, right, or thing in itself regardless of perception, um, right? So the physical thing is, is actually goes beyond perception then. Is transcendent to it. So the physical thing cannot be given in any possible perception, in any possible consciousness. It's something really inherently imminent, right? Because you have this problem of adumbrations of physical, you know, all of these adumbrations. I never, the thing is a unit, one thing, it's a unitary object, but I can only perceive it by modes and concatenations and syntheses of perspective. Then that means uh, that what I'm experiencing in the imminent reality isn't the real thing itself. Um, so there must be two types of being, two types of existing. There's existing as a mental process, and there's existing as a physical thing, right? Um, and of course, you can see here by delineating these, we give fi uh, we give the phenomenologist the ability to be able to differentiate, uh, to not confuse naturalistic psychology with what the phenomenologist is doing, uh, right? Remember, Husserl is adamant, adamantly against psychologism, and he was accused of it really his entire career, and still is today by some. Um, and so you can see here, this is one of the reasons he wants to clearly delineate this stuff. He doesn't think he's doing a psychologism because there is no naturalism at work. Uh, and, I mean, he has lots more reasons besides that, but those are that's one of the um, uh, the supporting movements of his view. Okay, but it's important we stop real fast and think there's actually a huge error that's uh, that's possible. And so he wants to, to sort of stop stop the entire investigation and clarify a fundamental error, right? He says it's erroneous to believe that perception does not reach the physical thing. It's fundamentally erroneous to believe that perception does not reach the physical thing itself, right? Because I, even though there's a difference between my perception, because of the determinate quality of the concatenations of experiences I have, right, there is a unitary physical thing, so there is a way in which perception does reach the physical thing, right? You can see here, what he wants to guard against is a, solips, a solipsistic form of idealism here, um, right? So there's an essential difference between what we're talking about when we're talking about the transcendent and the imminent, right? And there's an equivocation in which we can conflate those two things together. Uh, we can conflate what's imminently in our perception with the transcendent, right? So the transcendent belonging to the, to the spatial physical thing itself, and the transcendence that belongs to something depicted or represented, right? Because in my experience, in my imminent experience, the, um, each one of these concatenations, right, um, represents this sort of physical thing, and there is there is something transcendent in that representing, right, in the consciousness, and there's also something transcendent in the physical thing itself. So there's in the same way that there's a sort of split here between um, um, consciousness regarding the subject and consciousness regarding the world, right? We can also recognize that there's a split here in terms of the language of transcendentalism. Um, or that which is transcendental. And he's, this is sort of the difference between presentation uh, presentation and symbolization, uh, as it were. Okay, so 44, we're almost done here. Um, I know this is a long video. Um, section 44, it's merely phenomenal being of something transcendent, absolute being of something imminent, right? So the perception of a physical thing is inadequate, though, right? Because it's given through mo multiple modes of perspective. So here's sort of an example. You can see we only have one perspective of the ship in the picture, right? The only perspective we have is the, of its, I guess, um, you know, of its back, of its rudder. Um, but, of course, so you can see here that uh, our perception of the physical thing is inadequate to actually get us to this sort of true actuality. Um, and it's because it's given through multiple modes. So that means that our perception is not a true givenness, as it were. The physical object is not truly given to me in its full concrete 
unity in actuality in my perception because of these modalities. Okay, so if the sense of the physical thing is determined by the data of physical thing perception, then the sense demands such an imperfection and necessarily refers us to continuously unitary concatenations of possible perception, which extend in infinitely many directions in a systematically and rig rigidly regular manner. Right. Uh, so in perception there, but the, one of the important features here is that these concatenations of experience, even though they're inadequate, they they there's a, like an infinitely many directionality to it. Um, where it just continues on, but it's rigorous and systematically uniformed, right? So there's a horizon, as it were, of determinable indeterminateness, right? That is, we can determine and recognize that outside of the horizon of an, an immediate unitary concatenation of experience, there's still another concatenation on the other side. That's what it means to look around and see another physical object, right? Um, and we, in, in consciousness, that means that we, we, there's an indeterminate, there's an indeterminateness to reality that we can determine, as it were. So determinable indeterminateness. Uh, try to say that ten times quickly. Um, so here's a couple of considerations, though, right, that Husserl makes. Number one is that there's no mental processes presented, uh, and the perception of a mental process is perceptually given as something absolute. Um, and a mental, three, a mental process of feeling is not adumbrated. Right? That's an important sort of consideration. When I feel despair, there's no adumbration there. Um, so not all forms of experience are adum adumbrated. Right? Um, so he says it's essential. He says, whereas it is essential to givenness by appearances that no p appearance presents the affair as something absolute, instead of in a one-sided presentation, it is essential to the givenness of something imminent, precisely to present something absolute which cannot ever be presented with respect to sides or be adumbrated. So we can all we have to also consider the that which is non-adumbrated. So the adumbrations of a physical object are not themselves given as adumbrations. Right? That is sort of so in consciousness, remember we're delineating and thinking about these sorts of different relations, right? Even though when I experience the cup in terms of adumbrated movements and perspectives, right, even though there's these adumbrations, the adumbration, my experience itself is not adumbrated. It's direct, as it were. Um, and, and here we can begin to see that when we talk about the mental process, we're not really talking about one thing. Because the mental process, if we describe it, is a stream. And so I put sort of a river, or st river here. It's a stream of now points. And you can see we're starting to bump up to this idea that an important element of consciousness, of course, is its temporality. Um, and there, and there's, we're in time, but there's this stream of consciousness that's, that's actually occurring. Um, and this stream, right, it's a, we're experiencing things adumbratedly, but all of that stream is continuously given to us in a non adumbrated fashion. You can see that this must mean that there's something transcendentally di that differentiates um, the physical object from the consciousness. So what about unperceived mental processes and unperceived reality, right? So here, for instance, imagine a model where a person looks at an object, they perceive an object, this is intentionality, right? In any directionality, there's, some, there's as it were, always an unperceived background. There's always something the right we talk about the halo of consciousness, right? In this background field, um, understood as a, a field of simple observability, includes only really a small piece of my surrounding world. Even though the, as it were, um, in an indeterminate sense, I know that it extends on out, right? I know that if I open this door, I can keep going. I can leave the building. I can, and there's always going to be a surrounding world. But my actual field of experience is directed towards one thing at a time, as it were. And then I only get a little piece that's sort of in my immediate observability here, in terms of my immediate imminent experience. Now, so that means there's unperceived physical reality, and it's something that's essentially different from the necessarily intended to being of a mental process. So, because this mental process, because it's, um, it's different, has a being, right, has an existence of some form, and it's essentially different from the intended to being of the mental process, uh, because it's unperceived, as it were. Um, 
Right. So what does this mean? It means that ultimately Husserl moves to the to the recognition of the indubitability of the perception of something that's imminent, right? Because when I perceive it in the imminent sense, um, it's not adumbrated, right? Um, and there's a dubitability of perception of something something transcendent. So what are the consequences of all of this uh, from Husserl's perspective? Well, I've just sort of written down what I think are some of the key moments. And I encourage you, again, this is not an exhaustive analysis of Husserl's chapter here. But at the end here, we sort of re realize that every perception of something imminent, something in the here and now, necessarily guarantees the existence of its object, right? In the natural attitude, right? Um, so my perception of something as in the here and now um, is precisely an imminent experience of the world because there's an existence for that object in some way, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not wrong about these things sometimes, right? And the other thing we can recognize is there's a stream of the mental process, and this is what we call our, it's a flowing life. This is what I am. This is what it means to be living, actually, is to be have this stream um, of the mental process um, going. And so physical existence is always contingently constituted. Um, uh, because the physical existence depends upon the adumbrations of my experience. Uh, and so it's n uh, so no perception of the physical world is absolute, as it were. So when we talk about physical existence, and of course, Husserl is in favor of physics, so am I, right? But physical, physical existence is therefore always contingently constituted, right? That's also an important feature for understanding why science can evolve and change theses over time. That's because of the because our experience of it is contingent, right? So what is there for me in the physical world is a presumptive actuality. Since it's contingent, um, I presume that what's existing, the object that's existing in the world is a physical thing and it's there and it's there for me. But that's a presumption. So anything physical can be non-existent, right? Um, and then no mental, and that makes sense too. Uh, and when I say non-existent, I mean anything that I perceive as physical, I can also perceive as, can also go out of existence, right? Um, and also I can begin to recognize that maybe my experience of the physical was wrong, and therefore what I thought was physical was actually something that didn't exist as well, right? So no mental process which is given in a person, though, can be non-existent. Because if the process is non-existent, then in the person, then there is no mental process at all, right? Or there's no conscious mental process. So that means that un whereas the physical thing, um, because I can be wrong about it, and because of the contingency of my understanding of the existence of the physical thing, right? And think here about former theories of, of anatomy and physiology, for instance, in the Renaissance, you know, their beliefs about how the circulatory system worked, for instance, right? They were wrong. Right? They thought it existed. They, they thought they had physical evidence for it. Right? Um, but they were wrong because it was contingent, right? and so on and so forth. So uh, physical things have a, this sort of contingent, ex existential contingency. But the mental process, in the act of being a mental process, is not contingent because, it's exist because uh, the existence is required because that's the way in which the mental process is even given. So no experiential evidence can make the physical world certain, right? No experiential or evidence can, can make that certain for us. Um, so there's a degree of certainty here that's much higher, actually, uh, when we do phenomenology. And this is why the, and of course, this is why he's, for him, the phenomenology as an eidetic science is about the essences of things, right? In terms of a un, the, their universal deployability, as it were. Um, okay, so I, that's where we're going to end the, the, the video for today. Um, thank you guys for watching. I hope this made sense. I know that Husserl is, can be confusing, but he's trying to slowly understand his experience. And I think the best way you can understand this is follow along, read, the, read Husserl's text, but also begin to try to think through what is necessary in the features of your consciousness. Because clearly, you have a consciousness of the world, but there's, there's an act of constant consciousing things as well, that intending things. And so explore this. I hope this is interesting. Um, I promise you that as we continue this, uh, there'll be um, there'll be a reward at the end, conceptually and philosophically. So thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you guys online. In our next video, we'll look at the next chapter.